morning, everyone. Um, good to see everybody and good to be back in the book of Song of Solomon with you all. I feel like you had a good warm up last Sunday and we kind of got all the maybe some of the nervousness, some of the awkwardness out of the way so that we're ready to go this morning and get into chapter three as we pick up this morning. Just a reminder, this book is a surrealistic love song celebrating the beauty and power of romantic love and sexuality within marriage. And as part of the wisdom literature, though, it does provide warnings throughout about love. And while certainly things in this book apply to men and women, as we suggested, the book is actually written primarily with young women in mind, like the Proverbs had young men in mind. It talks about the sexual union between Solomon and this woman, uh, not in a clinical or crude way, but using imagery from nature so that everybody knows, especially married couples, know exactly what they're talking about, but it's still, it's still elusive and mysterious enough to not be graphic or, or crude. In chapter one and two, chapters one and two, it seemed like everything was going great. He married her, she loves him, their physical intimacy is powerful and it is intoxicating. But as we pick up in chapter three, uh, it seems like there's something wrong. And before we get there, uh, let's go to God in prayer. <coughs> Father in heaven, we praise your name. We praise you for your greatness and your glory. We praise you for uh, the way that you sent Jesus to redeem us um, as, your, as your bride to wash us clean and pure so that we could have a relationship with you, an intimate, one spirit relationship with you in Christ. And we are so grateful for your mercy. Thank you for this book, and we pray, God, that the Song of Solomon will help transform our marriages and will help take the warnings about love and awakening it too early. Take those things to heart so that we can honor you and glorify you in every aspect of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it seems like something's wrong in chapter 3. This section has been variously interpreted, but I think it makes the most sense as this woman thinking back to the time uh, when she was single uh, and how she used to have anxious dreams about not finding her beloved. Remember back in chapter 1 and verse 6, she said that while she was out busy, in, apparently in her single life, <laughs> busy out working in the vineyards, that she was not able to take care of her own vineyard, the, the, the vineyard of her body. And there is a certain natural level of anxiety that goes along with that because you long for love but you haven't found it yet and it may keep you up at night wondering whether you ever will and so we see in uh, verses one through four she says on my bed night after night i sought him whom my soul loves i sought him but did not find him I must arise now and go about the city and the streets and in the squares. I must seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him but did not find him. The watchmen who make the rounds in the city found me. And I said, have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I left them when I found him whom my soul loves. And I held on to him and I would not let him go until I had brought him to my mother's house and into the room of her who conceived me. So this takes place on her bed at night, which implies that she was dreaming. And many times we dream about our fears and our anxieties. In this dream, there's kind of this desperate, frantic search for her lover, and she can't seem to find him. But when she finally does, she grabs hold of him, and she cherishes him and takes him into the room of her mother who conceived him. Now, there's, uh, this imagery is repeated throughout the book about this idea of them going to their mother's Room, And I think the point here is that she is continuing in her own generation what her mother and her husband had in their generation. The point here is she marries him, and just like her mother brought her husband to the marriage bed and bore children, here she's repeating that pattern in her generation. Uh, and there's a good application here that sometimes single people, maybe especially young women, though certainly it applies to young men, but maybe especially young women, since they're in the more passive role and they kind of have to wait on the men to make a move, they have fear and anxiety that they, they may never find a husband. You search, search, can't seem to find them. You think to yourself, you know, everyone else is getting married, but, but I'm not. Is there something wrong with me? And this is a good time to warn the young women who are reading this book in verse 5. She says, I adjure you. O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles of the hinds of the field, that you not arouse or awaken love until it pleases. 
It's a good time to warn young ladies not to allow your desperation for love to lead you down the wrong path. And again, it applies to men too. But if we allow the fear of being alone to awaken this romantic sexual love too soon, like before marriage, or too quickly, like rushing into marriage with the wrong person, it'll really make a mess of things. And in verses 6 through 11, she describes a remembrance of their wedding day. In our, in our culture, the bride is the focus, right? Grooms just kind of stand there today, right? And uh, when the bride walks in, well, that's when everybody stands and they look with wonder and awe and admiration. It was the opposite in that culture. It was all about the, the groom in their culture. And so she has this great remembrance of Solomon coming out, decked out in royal attire, carried on a couch, probably on poles. He has 60 mighty soldiers around him, and all of this seems to symbolize his power to protect her and to take her under his wing. So before, she was anxious about being alone, but now that she has found Solomon, he has come to love her and provide for her and to protect her. I think what's interesting is all throughout this book, we get glimpses of this woman's insecurity about herself. In chapter 1, she was concerned about her social status because of her burnt skin. She called herself just one lily among many in chapter 2. And here in chapter 3, we see her anxieties and insecurities keeping her up at night. Yet in every instance, Solomon is there to reassure her, to make her feel safe, to make her feel beautiful. And one of the most important functions of a husband is to make their wives feel safe. Not just safe from physical harm, but from emotional harm, from spiritual harm, from financial harm. And safe from her own fears and insecurities that she isn't loved or that she isn't lovable. A woman feels most loved when she feels safe and protected. I also believe this is part of the imagery about the wilderness, like in verse 6 where Solomon comes up out of the wilderness. This is used several times in the book because the wilderness is a place of danger and wild animals and unpredictability. But he comes to save her from, from the wilderness. And again, we'll see that theme repeated. Uh, here's a question, and I, it's aimed toward husbands, but wives may actually be great to hear from on this point. Husbands, what are some ways to help make your wives feel safe? Or wives, what are some ways that you believe your husbands could help make you feel safe? Other than the obvious, taking martial arts class. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts on that, JC? Stability. All right. Stability. Okay, stability, right? Job stability. So. Uh, you know, part of that might be financial. It might be, hey, have a good income, but it, it could also be do your job, right? Be a reliable man who she can count on to do what he needs to do, right? To provide for her and for her family. Yeah, Phil? Just uh, outside of the bedroom, you show your wife affection and attention by holding her hand or giving her a hug or kissing her on your way out to work to reassure her of your love. Yeah, so regularly do things to reassure her that you, that you love her. Absolutely. Debbie? I know this might seem fun, but even with, with all the stuff there is in the world commercially that's anxiety producing, the news and all the stuff like that, when you can tend to be much more graphic <laughs> about things, you know, and sometimes I don't need to hear all that. So as far as being emotionally sensitivity to things, okay. I don't need to hear all the gory details about an accident or about you know stuff that's happened, you know, or uh, I don't want to watch war movies because yeah. of that. Okay. So I that makes me feel really insecure okay. unless somebody you know protects me from that. Yeah, so maybe a good, a good way to sum that up is you, you can't always talk to your wife the way you would your, your buddies, right, your, your guy friends, okay? Sometimes you need to shield her from some of the things that you, you might be talking about with your, um, with your male friends that may be a little harder to, harder to hear or, or rough, yeah. All right. Well, let's look in uh, 
chapter 4 because it seems most natural to read this as continuing the flashback and expounding on what it was like on their wedding night. It's the start of their honeymoon, and this is the first time that he gets to see her form, and so it's really a section praising her physical beauty. It's a sevenfold praise, uh, which he starts this off, um, starting with her eyes down to her breasts. And again, the imagery may seem a little weird to us, but it would have been very complimentary to her. Uh, We won't have time to go over this in detail, but here's my favorite one, verse 2. He says, your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewes, which have come up from their washing, all of which bear twins, and not one of them has lost her young. So, uh, you know, wool uh, on sheep tends to get pretty dirty, but when sheep are freshly shorn and washed, right, they're white and they're glistening. And then he says the white sheep bear twins and they don't lose any of them. In other words, your teeth are white and you have all of them. (laughs) That probably would have been pretty special back then, right? (laughs) They didn't have the dental uh, hygiene and resources that, that we have today. And so that would have been That would have been quite a compliment. And he really sums it up well in verse 7. He says, You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. Just like the lambs offered in the temple as sacrifices were to have no blemish on them, he says to her that she is perfect to him in in every way. And he invites her again uh, from the wilderness and from places of danger down to a place of safety with him in verse 8. Uh, and then verse 9 is just great. He says, you, you have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. You know, just like in the movie Bambi, when the flowers are in bloom and it's it's springtime and love is in the air. He is all Twitter pated. <laughs> Just looking at her makes his heart race. And there's an interesting verse as well in the middle, in the middle of this extended praise of her beauty. He, look in verse 12. He says, A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A rock garden locked, a, sing, a spring sealed up. So he actually praises her virginity. She has kept her garden locked and sealed up before marriage and saves herself just for him. And on their wedding night, she unlocks her garden and allows him entrance. And that's what we see in verse 16 and on into chapter 5, verse 1. She says, Awake, O north wind, and come, wind of the south, and make my garden breathe out fragrance. Let its spices be wafted abroad. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its choice fruits. And then he speaks in verse 1 of chapter 5, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh along with my balsam. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, friends, drink and imbibe deeply, O lovers. So he gets now to partake on their wedding night of her, the fruits of her body. And it seems like the chorus of the daughters of Jerusalem chime in at the end of verse 1, and they say, Eat, friends, drink, and imbibe deeply, O lovers. And there's such a good application here that young ladies, and of course, again, young men too, but this is written to young ladies, so I'm not picking on the young ladies, but young ladies need to know that when they keep their gardens locked before marriage, that's a wonderful thing. Not only to God, but also to your future husband. Unlocking your garden too soon will mess up God's beautiful plan for you in marriage. Many young people, both girls and boys, grow up thinking they need to abstain from premarital sex because sex is bad. No. The reason we abstain from premarital sex is because sex is so good in its proper context. God is not trying to remove pleasure from us by condemning fornication. He's trying to enhance the pleasure and the enjoyment of the one flesh union in marriage. And parents can, you can help your, your children, especially your teenagers, understand this point. Any comments or questions through chapter 4? Sure. Um, Garden seems to be a reference to um, her body, particularly the most private parts of her body. Yeah. 
Yeah, all throughout the Song of Solomon, they use language like garden and vineyard, um, nature language to describe their bodies. Good. All right, and I know this, this class is hard to make comments or questions. I get it, so I'm, I won't guilt you too much <laughs> on that. <clears throat> well, how about chapter 5? Because married couples all understand that the way things were on your honeymoon are not always the way things are when you are married. Things get in the way of intimacy all the time. And sometimes you're just not in sync. The foxes overrun the vineyards. The schedules are too full. You and your spouse get in arguments. You find you don't see eye to eye on things. Sometimes you annoy each other. <laughs> Sometimes you just get so used to each other uh, that the spark kind of dies out. Well, here we have another dream sequence, but it seems like this time it happens while they're married. And there seem, it, it seems to be just a figurative, surrealistic way to describe tension in their marriage that has temporarily hindered their love life. So listen to verse 2 through 4. She says, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice, my beloved, was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is drenched with dew and my locks with the damp of the night. And it seems like she replies here in verse 3. I have taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I, I have washed my feet. How can I dirty them again? My beloved extended his hand through the opening and my feelings were aroused for him. So he, he wants her to open the door to him. He wants to be intimate with her. But for some reason she rejects him and she does not let him in at first. Yet because he kept pleading with her, she eventually softens to him. But by then it's too late because if you continue reading verse 5, I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and had gone. My heart went out to him as he spoke, and I, I searched for him, but I, I did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer me. And the watchmen who make the rounds in the city, they found me, and they, they struck me and wounded me. The, the guardsmen of the walls took away my shawl from me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, as to what you will tell him, for I am lovesick. The fact that her hands and fingers are dripping with myrrh here implies that she was ready for love and, and intimacy with him, but when she opened the door, he wasn't there. Um, this may capture the reality that sometimes the husband is in the mood to make love, and the wife is not, and other times the wife is in the mood to make love, and the husband is not. But I think there's probably more going on here. There's, there's some deep tension in this marriage, which is why the, the harsh language, I think. With a, in the earlier dream, you know, the guardsmen were there, and she talked to the guardsmen of the city, and they didn't really say anything to her, really. Do, but here, they, they actually beat her. So we don't know why, right? Everybody's, well, why are they beating her? That doesn't even seem to make sense. But I, I think it's just to capture this, this pain that she's in, that, that things are not going well between her and her husband. And she wants to be intimate with him, but things are just not right in their marriage. And, and she longs to, to find him and, and make things right. In fact, she says, I, I'm lovesick. Right? She, she longs for him, but she can't find him. And, and her friends offer to help find him. But interestingly, in order to, well, I meant to click a long time ago. In order to help find him, they ask her why he's worth finding. Verse 9. What kind of beloved is your beloved? Oh, most beautiful among women. What kind of beloved is your beloved that thus you adjure us? And then in verses 10 through 16, she describes him in great detail, much like he described her. In detail before. And verse 16 is really beautiful. And verse 16 says, His mouth is full of sweetness, and he is wholly desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So not only does she describe him as physically attractive, she also calls him her, her friend, her beloved and her friend. Some application here, sometimes life can get in the way of your intimacy with your spouse. Sometimes it's your own sinfulness that gets in the way. But whatever it is that is getting in the way of the beauty of what God designed for your marriage, 
your spouse is worth seeking and finding. When there is tension, it's always great to remind yourself, what kind of beloved is your beloved? What, what makes your beloved so, so wonderful that you would want to go and seek and find this person and reconcile whatever issues that you're having so that you can restore the intimacy that you had before? And here's another application. I understand uh, trying to be friends first with a girl can be risky because you can get put in a friend zone. I speak from experience with that. It's a horrible place to be. But our spouses really should be our best friends. Comments or thoughts on chapter 5? Debbie. Just that, um, um, I've heard it said that sex, be, sex, your major sex organ for women is your brain. And, that's, and that speaks to that. That yeah. you have to be, be there and you have to think about your husband in all the right ways. And you create that desire by, by praising him, remembering why you married him. Yes, I've heard the same thing. You know, the, the, it starts in the mind, that, that intimacy. And if your thinking is not right about your spouse, it's going to be very hard to open up to them and, and be intimate. Mike and then Jeff. I think part of her anxiety was she had seven hundred lives and three hundred concubines, so she had competition. Well, okay, so it could be. Um, I don't know about that because, as we suggested in the intro class, this could have been early on in his reign, so we don't know how many wives he had at this point at this point. Um, others have suggested as well that um, many of the wives that he may have had at this point were merely for the purposes of political alliance, but he didn't really love them. It was just, you know, he was making peace with all these nations as he expanded out his empire, but she was the one that he truly loved. So we don't, we don't really have all those answers, but yeah, of course, that, that's the classic things that comes up in the Song of Solomon. How can this guy write about intimacy when he's got, you know, hundreds of, of wives? Well, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question, but it, those might be some solutions. Jeff? Uh, to go to what Debbie said, I think it would be good for both husbands and wives to take the time to try to answer the question in verse number nine about their spouse. Yes. Yeah. Who, who, which one of us could describe our, our, our spouse the way they describe it here? Probably not, but you can kind of find some way to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Whether it's just internally into yourself, yes. why do I love this woman, or why do I love this man? Or even better, if you could express that to your spouse, would be a little out of the way. Yes. Too many times we're so busy, we don't even think about that. That's, yeah. just, that's just my spouse. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, I, you know, so the, the classic saying is, right, like I, I told her I loved her once and I'll let her know if I ever change my mind. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a good approach. Right? Uh, you know, but, but there is kind of that, even if you don't say that out loud, there's kind of that unspoken like, oh, she already knows how I feel or he already knows how I feel. Well, maybe not, you know, because there's a lot of insecurities, both in the husband and the wife, that, that you, you can help each other with and dwelling on those, those wonderful things about your, your spouse, what kind of beloved you have, is such a great way to help with intimacy, and which is why it's one of my points in my sermon. All right, John. Um, I think I kind of, the phrase that comes to my mind is, some, and, and I understand, you know, it's good to tell your wife that you love her and things like this. But sometimes actions speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. And especially through dire situations when things are going real bad. Yeah. And you're putting certain things aside to make sure that... Yeah, that's a great point. And that goes to, you know, one of the ways you can help your your spouse, especially your wife, to feel safe is you're, you're just going to say, look, I, I don't care what's happening. I'm putting you first. I'm putting our relationship first. And I'm going to be sacrificial like Christ, right, in, in Ephesians chapter 5. Um, so, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's a really good, really good point. It's easy to say you love someone, but are you showing them that you love them? <laughs> that's true with God. It's true in our marriages. It's true in our friendships. Yeah. All right, well, how about chapter 6? Uh, because it, it seems like all is well again in chapter 6, and, and it just happens very suddenly. I mean, there's just not much 
said uh, about how they reconciled their differences, but it just seems like all of a sudden in verse 2 and 3 that they're back together and she's in his arms again and they're, you know, everything is just great. And then in chapter, or verses 4 through 9, he compliments her again and describes how unique she is. In verses 10 through 12, she's once again taken away by Solomon and, and it's as if uh, their wedding night is happening all over again, so much so that her friends are begging her not to go away and to, and to leave them uh, again. Uh, verse 13, uh, let's look at that for just a second. It's, this is one of the hardest verses in the, in the book. It classically brings a ton of discussion. But verse 13, apparently these are her friends saying this to her. Uh, come back, come back, O Shulamite, come back, come back that we may gaze at you. And then it seems like, she, the, the Shulamite, she responds, why should you gaze at the Shulamite as at the dance of the two companies? Or maybe he's responding to, to the, her friends. Um, but now that things have been made well between them, her friends feel like she's, she's leaving them all over again. They're, you know, they're saying, come, you know, come back. right? <laughs> like, we're, we're glad that you found your beloved and you're, you're with him and everything's great, but you know, now we, we may... We don't have enough as much time to spend time with you as, as we did before. And it's nice for her maybe to have her friends admiring her beauty in a strictly friendly way, but she'd much rather have Solomon admiring her beauty, right, in a, in a marital, uh, sexual sort of way. Now, I need to make this point about the Shulamite comment. It's only found here in this verse. Only time she's called a Shulamite. So we need to be careful making too much of this. Um, there's no village, no city that we know of that's called Shulam. So people have tried to, you know, make this her cultural, you know, background geographically where she comes from. Um, I really think that's not the best way to handle it. Because the word Shulamite in Hebrew is just the female version of Solomon. So it really just means that she's Solomon's. She, she belongs to him. And when you think about the word Solomon, that word means peace or, or whole. Well, because she is Solomon's, <laughs> she is at peace. And she is whole when she is with him. I think that's really the idea of calling her the the shoe line. Now, if she was called that all the time throughout the book or something, maybe we could make more of it, but um, I think that makes the most, the most sense at this point. Um, okay, that was supposed to click again. All right, let's look in chapter 7. Chapter 7, here he, uh, let's see, it's like their wedding night all over again. Okay, in verses 1 through 9, the first part of verse 9, he launches off on a list of compliments again. But this time, it's not seven compliments, it's ten compliments. Um, and this time, he starts at her feet and goes up. Before, he started at her head and went down. This he starts at feet, feet and goes up. <laughs> um, I, I think there's something interesting here by way of application, that as, as we grow older and change physically, some believe that means that there can no longer be any intimacy in, in your marriage. It just, it just takes a severe hit, and there just isn't any pleasure in the bedroom anymore after you've been married for a while. But what we see in the Song of Solomon is that the very first time they were intimate, he complimented her seven ways. But here, perhaps as more time has passed, and it's definitely not their first time, he compliments her ten times. So it, it may be that the nature of the one flesh relationship changes in some ways as you get older, but it should actually be getting better over time. The more you learn about each other, the closer you draw to God, and the closer friends you become over time. And after he compliments her, she responds pretty bluntly and wants him to just come away with her. Let's go. Verse 9, the second part, uh, she says, uh, It goes down smoothly for my beloved, flowing gently through the lips of those who fall asleep. Uh, verse 10, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go out into the country. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us rise early and go to the vineyards. Let us see whether the vine has budded and its blossoms have opened and whether the pomegranates have bloomed. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes have given forth fragrance and over our door are all choice fruits, both new and old, which I have saved up for you. 
my beloved. Um, and again, there may be some nuance there, this idea of new and old fruit, um, to the application that I was just making there. Um, that even though some of the newness of their intimacy may have, may have worn off, um, there's still enjoyment even in things that they have experienced before together. Um, and we see something else here as well. And Phil kind of hinted at this in, in his comment, but compliments are a prelude, a great prelude to intimacy. Um, it's especially key for men to keep in mind as they compliment their wives. It's, it's really interesting that in the Song of Solomon, he never treats her like she's just an object for his pleasure. He treats her with kindness, with tenderness. He pays her compliments. He notices little things about her that maybe no one else would. And it's only after all that that she opens her garden to him. It has been said uh, when it comes, and I, it's a little bit humorous, but uh, when it comes to sexual readiness, that women are like crockpots and men are like toasters. In order for women to be ready for intimacy, she has to be kept on a low simmer all day. And you can do that, men, by complimenting her and flirting with her. And as Phil said, holding her hand and touching her in non-sexual ways throughout the day. That's hard for men because men don't need to simmer. We can just flip a switch. But Solomon never just flips a switch on her in this book. He woos her. He dotes on her. He makes her feel safe. He makes her feel loved. He makes her feel beautiful. And then she, she re just naturally responds and, and opens up to that. Some men just treat their wives so, with such cruelty. And then they wonder, well, what's her problem? How come she doesn't want to be intimate with me? Well, because you closed her up with your cruelty. But she opens and responds to your kindness and your compliments, sincere compliments and love. Any comments on chapter 6 or 7 or questions? <clears throat> Brenda? Brenda? to say that um, he's giving her time. You know, he's a king, he's busy. He's obviously got a lot going on. And in, in chapter five, I saw her anxiety in that, the same anxieties that she expressed earlier in the book. She just doesn't think she's good enough. She's just not sure. And when he has to go off and do his, you know, his responsibilities, those same anxieties prey on her mind. Yeah. You know, is he going to come back? Is he? It, it, am I going to get his attention again like I did before? So I mean, he's showing her in, in seven, you know, he's spending time with her again. So yeah. when you've had that, you know, I know that's hard to do in modern life, you know, spend the time with somebody. We, we're, so, we're so hurting for time to be together. Mm -hmm. And so he's taking time out of his, you know, his responsibilities, which would be yeah. many. Spending time with her and talking. I really like that point. I mean, if you think about it, she's she's calling him, and I, I really understand this to be more figurative in, in nature. When she says, "Come away with me," right? Come out to the villages. Well, he can't. He's the king. He has too much to do. Uh, but as you pointed out, in a, in a figurative sense, yes, he does take the time to get away with her, to be alone with her, and to put her even before so many of his kingly responsibilities. And I, I think that's a great point because if we think we're busy, imagine what it would be like to run an entire kingdom and the, the largest kingdom, the, the world empire at the time. And we know how busy he was and all the time he had in office. All the people that he contacted and the comings and goings of kings to come see him. I mean, it's yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really good, really good thought. Let's, let's get in chapter eight because I, I, I want to spend some time a little bit more time in chapter 8 than the other chapters, because <clears throat> this is a, a, like an epilogue at the end of the book on the power of love. Um, there's just some really interesting verses and really, really fascinating and powerful thoughts in this, in this chapter. Verses 1 through 4 seems a little bit odd, but she seems to wish as if he were her literal brother. All right, so let's see what, what she's thinking and, and why that is. Listen, listen to what she says. Oh, that you were like a brother to me who nursed at my mother's breast. If I found you outdoors, I would kiss you, and no one would despise me either. 
I would lead you and bring you into my house of my mother who used to instruct me. I'd give you spiced wine to drink from the juice of my pomegranates. Uh, let his left hand be under my head and his right hand embrace me. Um, I want you to swear, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not arouse or awaken love until it pleases. So, uh, you know, this is definitely a strange passage, but it seems like the reason she wishes. Okay, so let's, let's be careful not to take this too far, but the reason she wishes that he were her literal brother is simply so that she could show him affection out in public. Um, We don't know a whole lot about their social mores at the time, but apparently if you were with your literal brother or sister out in public, you could show them signs of affection, like kiss him on the cheek or maybe hug him or something like that. But if it was with your husband, it would be inappropriate because of the sexual connotations. And then we see that warning again. It's worded a little bit differently, but the same warning, not to arouse love before it awakens. And I think there's some application here that that love, because it is so powerful, requires discretion out in public. Part of not awakening love before its time is to use discretion about public displays of affection. There is something about young people, especially, who do not understand or appreciate this principle. And sometimes they put their affection on display for everyone to see, even when they're not married. Um, I heard about a married couple who was singing hymns together in worship, and they each had their hand in their back pocket. Okay, well, they're married, but... That's a very inappropriate setting, right, to be showing that kind of sexual love uh, with, with one another. Um, and yet sometimes even Christians who, who aren't married or who are dating are, are hanging all over each other, engaging in long, passionate kisses out in public places. I'll, I'll just say even long, passionate kisses between married couples out in public is... Uh, it's a little much. Even, even in our culture, we recognize that that's a, that's a little bit inappropriate, right? What do we say? You know, get a room. That's what we say when we, when we see that stuff. And yet, how much less appropriate is it with Christians who aren't even married, and yet they're engaging and, you know, they're making out in, in public and all that. And, and I will just say this, too, that making out long, passionate kissing before marriage can get you into serious trouble even in private, because it can easily arouse love before it's time. And how many people? That's where it starts. And then they, I don't know what happened. I mean, I I thought I was strong enough. I thought, and you just, it's one of the strongest temptations to, to deal with. And you have to be very careful in exercising discretion, whether you're married or not, about, about the affection that you're showing the person that you love because love will blind you to judgment and good reason. Uh, Well, her friends in verse 5 then see her coming up from the wilderness with her beloved, and and then she talks about being with her beloved under the apple tree, and there's another reference to to her her mother, and that love is so powerful, you know, it carries over from generation to generation. But now for the first time in the book, we have this beautiful and powerful description of what love is like. She says in verse 6, Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as severe as Sheol. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. So she wants to be a seal on his heart. A seal or a stamp was a mark of ownership. So she wants to make clear that he belongs to her, she belongs to him. And that's really what love requires. And it's as strong as death. When death gets a hold of you, you you can't escape. The same way with love. It's this powerful, unstoppable force that grips you and takes hold of you so that you're filled with jealousy for the person that you love. Not the bad kind of jealousy, though love can certainly cause you to have the bad kind of jealousy, but the good kind of jealousy in marriage that burns with passion for the one who belongs to you. See, bad jealousy burns with passion for a person who does not belong to you. Good jealousy burns with passion for a person who does belong to you. It's a good distinction. It's why God says, I'm a jealous God, and yet he can condemn jealousy. It's not a contradiction. (laughs) 
God's condemning bad jealousy, but he's a jealous God because we belong to him and he will share us with no one else. And it's the same sort of jealousy in marriage that is necessary and good. And she says love is like flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. This probably refers to lightning. But even today, we talk about love being electric, and it burns so strong, waters can't even quench it, um, and it can't be bought with money. <laughs> you can't pay someone to love you. You can't ignite the flames of love with riches. And then in verse 8 and 9, because love is so strong, um, the daughters of Jerusalem wonder how they can keep their virgin friends from awakening love too soon. If she's a wall, meaning she's closed off to sexual advances, that's a good thing, and they will help strengthen that wall. But if she's a door, meaning she's boy crazy and willing to give anyone access to her garden, they'll put up barricades to keep that door closed. And there's application there that maintaining one's sexual purity before marriage is so important that the people in a young girl's life need to help her with that. Her parents, her friends, her siblings need to encourage her to save herself for her husband and maintain her purity. And if she's open to sexual advances too soon, and it seems like she's getting swept away by the current and the torrent of love's seductive power before marriage, we better help put up barricades keep that from happening as best we can. And you can't make anybody do, do anything, right? You can't force people to make the right choices. But one's virginity and chastity before marriage is absolutely worth fighting for and helping not only young ladies, but also helping young men understand that as well. In verses 10 through 12, I just want to make sure that I'm getting through the book here. Verse 10 through 12, um, another kind of interesting passage uh, to decipher, but it seems like she was a virgin until she married Solomon, her love. She says, I was a wall. <laughs> uh, but now she compares a literal vineyard that Solomon owns to the metaphorical vineyard of her body. Solomon owns a vineyard, literally, and while Solomon gets the majority of the profit from it, he still has to pay his caretakers a portion of that profit. Well, she owns a vineyard too, the vineyard of her body. Yet she speaks as if Solomon owns it. She says that he gets the major profit from her vineyard. She gets a profit too because she's the caretaker of her vineyard. But he gets the main profit. It's like when Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 7 about marriage and how your body does not belong to you. It's for your spouse. The sexual relationship is not meant to be selfish, but selfless. So that yes, you get a benefit from the sexual relationship, but the main profit, the main benefit should be for your spouse. Your spouse should be reaping the most benefits from the vineyard of, of your body, though we of course benefit as well. And then the book ends in these last two verses. It seems like he's speaking in verse 13, um, where he says, Oh, you who sit in the gardens, my companions are listening for your voice. Let me hear it. And then she speaks in verse 14. Hurry, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. So uh, the point may be that her companions, the daughters of Jerusalem, this entire time throughout the book have been praising Solomon. But now at the end, he's saying, my friends are praising you. My friends want to hear your voice. And then the book kind of leaves us in suspense with one last invitation by her to come and, and be with her intimately. And maybe the, the book leaves us hanging to make the point that love is, love is never ending, right? It's, it's kind of a, a cycle, right? They, what was happening in chapter one is, yes, they had problems and all that, but they restored, and now at the very end, she's, he's still doting on her. She's still inviting him, him to love. So that's the Song of Solomon, at least my take on the Song of Solomon, and there are, there are many different ways to view that. Any comments or questions? Still a minute left. All right, Debbie. Oh, thank you. And you all did a great job not making me feel too weird. You know? <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, Vanessa. Yeah, no, it's fine. There are so many self-help books out there. So many books out there on how to live your life, how to be with you. Tons of relationship books. Incredible. And this is where God tells you how to live your life. And although it can be hard to understand sometimes. Um, sure. And I'm not totally down this, those books. Some of them are very helpful and very valuable. But God will always tell you. Right down to your intimacy, your 
father's house yes. and how to do that. And so we can just go back to him for everything, everything. He will tell you how to do it. Absolutely. God speaks to every area of our life, even the most intimate areas of our life. I really appreciate that. Well, on Wednesday, we're starting a new quarter. So you probably saw that there are new books out on the table in the foyer. Uh, go ahead and grab those and read through page five of that book as we get back, I think, into the book of First Kings, uh, where we left off. Done with the wisdom literature. 